We hope you enjoyed this teaching from Christchurch Birmingham. More teaching can be found at www.christchurchbirmingham.org. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Dan, married to Lucy. Um, I'd just like to pray. Um, Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you uh, that we can be with you, to be together, to be with you this morning. Thank you that you're already speaking to us, Father. I pray that you would continue to speak to us, Father. Continue to send your spirit on us. Thank you for your word. Father God, come and help me this morning to communicate your heart, Lord God, to us. Lord God, and I pray you bring freedom. You'd stir worship, Lord God. You reveal yourself to us more um, as we look at your word together. Amen. Okay, so I'm carrying on with, uh, we've been doing a series on uh, connections that count. And uh, we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians together. And uh, last week, Sharon spoke so helpfully on the single life. And uh, next week, Sarah, who's not here, that she's, she, she was going to be here this morning, but she's, she's helping, or she's a key part of uh, launching uh, Hope Church in West Bromwich this morning. So she's going to be back here next week talking on married life. And uh, this morning, I'm going to be speaking about what the Bible teaches us on allowing our hearts to be satisfied primarily in God rather than in our relationships with other people. So we've been reading through, as I say, through 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 10 this morning. We're going to be looking at that part of the Bible this morning. So I'm going to read this out now. Um, You're welcome to join me um, in whatever devices you've got. So this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. And so in these verses, Paul's teaching the guys in Corinth Christians in Corinth, a story from the history of Israel from many, many, many years before. And he starts off by pointing out how much God had blessed Israel. And God did amazing things for Israel that Paul's talking about here. And you can read these things yourself. This is all in the book of Exodus and the Bible. And this is what Paul's talking about, the stories from from Exodus, what happened to uh, the people of God there, the Israelites there. And uh, he talks about these things. He talks about the cloud and the sea and spiritual food and drink. So I just want to talk about what what that means. And uh, the cloud was a real visible cloud that was God's presence with the people of Israel as they traveled as a nation. Generally, if you think about a nation, you think of a group of people who are living in a particular place. Um, And at this time, the Israelites were a group of people, but they were traveling. And they were traveling to a particular place. And as they were traveling from Egypt, 
where they had been slaves. God miraculously freed them from slavery as a whole nation. And uh, they were traveling from Egypt. And as uh, a sign for the uh, a visible sign of God's presence with them, there was a cloud with them to show God's presence with them and God's blessing on them. And so that's firstly the cloud where God's blessed them as a, as a whole nation. It must have been an amazing experience, wasn't it, in the morning to get up in the morning, come out of your t- tent, perhaps you're, you know, you're just waking up and there's this cloud there and it's the presence of God <laughs> just, just there getting up in the morning. What a blessing. And then also he talks about the sea and he, this is a reminder of another type of blessing, another blessing that happened when the people of Israel were escaping from the army of Egypt. So they're, they're being rescued. They've, God's rescued them from that nation. They've escaped from the nation, but the army is chasing them. Can you imagine what it would be like, perhaps, if, if the government of the UK decided to persecute every Christian in the UK, and every Christian in the UK is fleeing, and we flee together, and the, they send the army against us and we're, we're running away and we get to this point where we get to the English Channel and we can't, there's nowhere else to go. That's what it was like for these guys. They get to the sea and there's nowhere else to go. It's a desperate situation but they see this massive blessing from God. Um, they see uh, God's hands moving and the sea divides. And, uh, and they're able to escape from the army. There's things happening behind me. Gino, are you, everything okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then finally, talks about the spiritual food and drink. And this would be the provision from God. So they're living in the desert for 40 years. As they're traveling, they're going through a desert. Not much food and drink in a desert. And, uh, and God provides for them. There's a spiritual blessing of God being with us, with them, but also the miraculous provision of food, fall, literally falling from the sky. And water coming from a rock, sustaining them um, through the 40 years. So, Paul then goes on to tell us that although they experience these amazing blessings from God, rather than setting their hearts on God completely, they set their hearts on evil things. And he tells us that this story gives us an example to learn from, that the story of what happens with these guys who have this amazing blessing, but then respond by allowing their hearts to be captivated by evil things. And when he's talking about not setting our hearts on evil things, he talks about this as not practicing idolatry. And uh, we might often think of idolatry as perhaps worshipping something physical, like a, a statue or an image of some kind. But Paul starts off by talking about what it is that they set their hearts on, in life, what's insight. And he talks here about the time when some of Israel make themselves an idol, the statue of a golden calf, well-known story. Um, but his quote here in 1 Corinthians, he doesn't specifically mention the calf, but he quotes directly from the book of Exodus about something that happens just after they've built this calf. And uh, he writes in 1 Corinthians, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And if you read the whole story in Exodus, you can see that this happens right after some people have made the golden calf. So they make the golden calf And then they worship it, they sacrifice to it, burnt offerings, things they they worship, this calf. Um, 
And then after their sacrifice, it said they decide they're going to have a, a, a festival, if you like. It says that they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And if you read what Paul writes, and if you read the story in Exodus, you realize that this is not just them having a nice party to celebrate. Essentially, this would have been more like an orgy, when anything went sexually, where bodies and people were worshipped rather than God himself. And so where Paul is talking about idolatry here, he's talking about setting their hearts on evil things, both the worship of the golden calf and the orgy that happens afterwards. And really, it's a tragic story. These people who've been so blessed by God. Um, But then we hear these stories about their hearts getting drawn away. So what about today? Um, It's easy to to hear about this story, to to see what Paul is writing and go back even further to the actual events in in Exodus and uh, and think, oh yeah, idolatry isn't really a thing for today. We're sort of beyond that now. We've developed a society. The difficulty with this is, is if it's not that important and, and, and it's like we've all got it sorted out, why is Paul talking about it? <laughs> and so to look at this, we need to th- have a look at what Paul is saying and have a think about why is this something we need to pay attention to today? And the reason we need to pay attention to it is because our hearts are our hearts whether we live now or whether we live 200 years ago 500 years ago a thousand years ago people's hearts don't change um you may have heard um gino so helpfully talk i don't know when it was gino on on the deceitfulness of the heart was it last year perhaps Uh, it might still hoping it might still be on the um, the website, because it's so helpful. Um, he talked about the fact that our hearts, and this is what from the Bible teaches us, that the heart is deceitful above all things. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to talk about the kinds of things that our hearts can, tend up, can end up worshipping today instead of Jesus. But I'm just going to read out a couple of definitions that I've read about what an idol is when we think about that for us today, if this is something we need to consider, uh, hear from God on today, what is an idol? Just going to read this out. What is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagine more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. A counterfeit God or idol is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. Then another definition. If anything becomes more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning, and life and identity, then it is an idol. So let's have a think about the sort of things that could end up becoming idols of our hearts today. If you could just bring up that first photo, the picture. That's it. It's not very difficult when you go start looking. Things that saved me, type it into Google, and actually you start to realize it's everywhere. <laughs> Things that saved me. And in some ways, you, you look at this photo and you look at this quote and you think, oh, well, that's okay. It's, it's an advert. It's probably about someone who's chosen a set of songs and these songs are very important to them. It's likely that these songs would have been very helpful to them. Maybe it would be songs that help them bring healing to that person after something really hard. Or it might be that the songs act as a powerful reminder for something really amazing and good that's happened to that person in the past, which are all fantastic things. Songs are really powerful gifts, aren't they, that we, we can use. We've been singing songs today. It's been powerful. Um, you can tell there's a buck coming here, can't you? 
The but is the quote <laughs> itself, which says that this list of songs is a list of songs that saved me. And in some ways, it might not seem that out of the ordinary. Actually, the reason it's not that out of the ordinary is because people say this all the time, don't we? <laughs> And we read it all the time in, in adverts like these. Um, if we look at what God's got to say about this, we can say, oh, yeah, no, it's just a turn of phrase. <laughs> or, you know, just something we say to really emphasize something really strongly. But actually, if you read in the book of Acts, the church comes alive. Jesus is risen from the dead, and Peter is preaching. I think it's Peter anyway. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation can be found in no one else, for there is no other name. We've been seeing that this morning, haven't we? Or we will be again in a bit. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Bring up the next slide. Not that one, the one before. Okay, so there's this one. This looks like it's the sort of thing that I might have spent hours digging around on the internet to find something really sort of like weird, okay? It's not. I saw it on a bus stop as I was walking through Birmingham. Okay? Holy hydration, your skin salvation, whether you slept in your makeup again, which I never wear, but that's by the by... <laughs> Or never reapply sunscreen. Skin sins happen. Get saved with ELF skin starting at six pounds. Six pounds for salvation, eh? It's really, actually, when you think about it, what it costs Jesus. <sighs> salvation. So as we start to think about idols of today, hopefully we're starting to see how actually we don't just have idols today, but we're actively encouraged <laughs> to have idols in our lives today, not just in adverts all over the place, wherever you look. So this isn't an advert, this is a news. Next one, uh, Dave. This is a genuine thing, you can look it up on the BBC website. Right move is my porn, the addiction to online property search. And hopefully this will show us that anything, <laughs> anything at all that isn't God can become an idol to us, can, can grab our hearts. And actually when, it, when they grab our hearts, we become slaves to those things. That's what addiction is, slavery to things that, that can be worshipped. Even to the point of addiction to online property searches. Do you know whether anyone struggles with that one? Maybe. So I've just got a list that I've made. And uh, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just, it's just a list of some things, other things that we could end up worshipping today that aren't God's. Food, popularity, entertainment, comfort, phones. Phones are down there twice. <laughs> I didn't realise until this morning. It's like a sort of weird thing, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe it emphasises it. <laughs> Safety. Now, a lot of these things, in fact, many of these things are good things. The problem is... Quite often, the better something is, the bigger the danger is that we might end up worshipping it because they're good things, but they're not God's. <laughs> and that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. There's a photo, another photo next. Does anyone know what, what this what I'm trying to show here? Thank you, Mr. Physics. Oh, we need a physics man for mirages. Dan's not here, so. <laughs> and so, do you know, 
yeah, I won't, we, won't, we won't go into a big lecture on it, but basically a mirage is something that happens. It's a genuine thing. Steve will be able to explain the physics to you later. Oh, he's nodding. He'll be able to explain the... <laughs> Jane's saying no. <laughs> explain to you later, maybe. And this is something about when our eyes get deceived. So our eyes can deceive us in mirages. We get deceived. And often... Mirages are in deserts. They're not always in deserts, but often they're in deserts. And so you can get these pictures where it looks like there's water in a desert. And it's the same with our hearts. So I've spoken about our hearts can get deceived. It's something that looks like it might be God, but it's not. It's not God. And our hearts can get deceived. In, in the Bible, there's a psalm about how it's only God. We might see some water in the desert, but it's only God who satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts. So Psalm 63 says this, or part of it. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. So let's move on and look at relationship. Now, relationship is really important to God. So Matthew, uh, book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, Someone asks Jesus a question. He says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Relationships, loving others, our neighbor, by the way, isn't just like the people who live in your street. This is anyone we come across. Loving others is so at the core of who God is and, and who he wants us to be. We are singing this morning about brothers and sisters and God being our father and we have Jesus the son. Relationships are so central to who God is. But only God himself can satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. So relationships are so important. Um, relations between people are good. We, we can be so blessed whether we've got, you know, having parents who we loved and are loved by or maybe siblings or children who we love and are loved by. They're wonderful, wonderful things and they are gifts from God. They can never take the place of God. They're wonderful. I don't want to, you know, neglect that. But they're not God. And that's, that's the lie that we, our hearts can get deceived by. It takes lies to de deceive our hearts, isn't it? And those are the lies. Even as Christians, we're part of an amazing church family. And we have amazing brothers and sisters in Christ here and across the nations. God gives us as gifts to one another. Jesus says, love one another. He, he teaches us to love one another, how important it is. But none of us are able to save each other or love or each other like God loves us. Only God saves us and no one can love us as deeply as he does. So as we come towards time of sort of responding, let's just talk about the idol of romantic relationships. Bring the, the so this is a, a film title. We're back to Who Saved Me? Who Saved Who? The girl that saved me. And there's lots of songs, aren't they? And I'm going to have got a couple of quotes in a second about that. God is not anti-romance, okay? Has anyone read Song of Songs in the Bible? <laughs> no? If you, if you haven't, then uh, it won't take you many lines in Song of Songs to realize that God is not anti-romance, okay? Um, but just like everything else in life that I've been talking about, 
romantic relationship or the pursuit of romantic relationship can be something that we worship. We put it in place of God. So not long after I became a Christian, a few years ago now, um, before I met my wife, Lucy, I became involved in a romantic relationship with someone who wasn't a Christian. And it became a very real battle for me. Who's, what is more important, this romantic relationship or God himself? It became very real. Looking back, it's crazy that I would put something like that above God. But that's, that was a real battle for me. And then in the book of Genesis, there's the story of Jacob who fell in love with a girl called Rachel. And he was so smitten with her that he agreed to earn her as his bride by working for her dad for seven years. And then at the end of the seven years, he was so consumed with desire for her, this romantic desire that had was become so big to him. He went up to her dad and basically said to her dad, give her to me now. I've done what I asked. I want to have sex with her. That's basically what he said. Even then, he didn't get what he wanted because somehow he, he, uh, Rachel's dad managed to, to deceive him and he ended up marrying um, his, uh, to Rachel's sister. And at those, ta- at those times, um, people would uh, have more than one wife. And um, so he said, I still want to marry Rachel. So he was made to work another seven years. And it was almost like a form of slavery that he got stuck into. And um, 14 years is a long time, by the way. I don't know if anyone can remember what they were doing 14 years ago. (laughs) Um, If you put any of these things with romantic relationships, whether it's the feelings involved or the promise of physical intimacy or the promise of commitment... If you put any of those things that, that sort of consist, exist within romantic relationship, we can easily put them above God. The problem is when that happens, that's when things start to go wrong or can go, go wrong. Do you want to bring up, there's a next slide. Does anyone know what song this comes from? Yeah, thank you. I thought it might be you guys who gave me that answer. <laughs> We actually sung a song, Great Big God, today, and you're beyond my wildest dreams. And I sort of think if I gave these two lines to the worship leaders here, maybe they could write me a worship song. But this wasn't about God. This was about a person. Do you want to bring up the next one? Thank you. Yeah, I thought that might might have a few more... uh, few more people know the arts this one but think about it there's a real challenge here perhaps what we think when we meet people for the first time whether it's in our street or at work maybe even at the pantry on a Sunday morning maybe you're going to be the one that saves me maybe you're going to be the one that saves me are we constantly looking for someone to save us The reality is, at some point, every person we meet, romantic relationship or close relationship, other relationship, is going to let us down or disappoint us. There are always times I am going to disappoint people. I am always going to let people down. I don't want to, but it happens. Because I'm not God. (laughs) So let's just briefly go back to this photo again. Maybe you can look at, at times, see people like this mirage in the desert. Perhaps there's a promise of satisfaction, the promise of salvation. So how do we respond? Paul says in the second half of chapter 10, flee from idolatry. And I just put in a couple of other verses to think about as we respond This is from another of Paul's letters from the letter to the church in Colossae. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. 
Let's be thankful for the relationships. They're gifts from God. They're good things. But they're gifts. They're not God. (laughs) Let's worship the giver. (laughs) Let's worship the giver. Let's keep choosing to accept Jesus alone at the center of our lives. This, I love these verses. Just as we receive Christ Jesus, keep living in him. Be rooted and built up in him. Let him be. Let him be your everything. <laughs> and then again, I've already quoted this. Salvation can be found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven, given among men which we must be saved. I think sometimes we can try and smuggle in idols. I told you the story earlier of um, Jacob and Rachel. And after they get married, Jacob decides to, to he's been living with his, uh, now his father-in-law for 14 years or more, and he decides it's time for him to move on, to move back to where he originally came from before he was living with them, And Rachel comes with him, and she knows that Jacob's desire is that he follows God alone. And what happens is she sort of tries to smuggle in some idols. So she's getting on her camel, and underneath her camel's saddle, sorry, not the camel, the saddle, where she's sitting, she hides some idols from her father's house. Just in case it doesn't work out with Jacob's God. (laughs) And I think we can sometimes be a bit like that, if if we're honest. Sometimes we are sort of say to Jesus, I will worship you alone, but then in the back of our minds, we're trying to hold on to other things just in case Jesus isn't enough. He is enough. He is enough. He is enough. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not known the depths of God's love for you in your own life. Ever. Maybe you've not known that. You've not known real salvation. And I want to encourage you to respond to him this morning. He sent his only son to die for you. So let's, let's turn to him. Let's turn to the God who loves us so deeply and saves us so completely. And in a moment, we're going to sing again together. But I'd just like us, if you can, to stand. I'm just going to pray. Sorry, I've gone a bit over time. Holy Spirit, we just want to invite you right now. You're the one who brings freedom. Where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. I pray you bring freedom right now, God, in our hearts, Lord God. We're not talking about anything else but our hearts. And I pray we you would come right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You pour out your Holy Spirit into our hearts. And I pray, God, just, just open your hearts. Let's open our hearts to him now. And there may be a specific relationship that God's bringing to mind, or maybe the desire for a romantic relationship that, that's overwhelming. Let's recognize that a person is a person created by God. And they cannot meet our needs to the depths that God can. I'm just going to wait a minute. Let's just open our hearts to him. Just bring those things to, to him. It may be that actually it's not a relationship. Maybe some of the things I talked about earlier, things that you just think, man, they're good things. And actually with relationship, the matter of relationship, the answer is not to love other people less. It's to receive God's love more and love God more. That's the response. It's not to love other people less. Okay. <laughs> it's, to, it's to come to him. Okay. To find contentment in him and enjoy his salvation. I'm just going to read out. We're going to sing a song in a second. I'm just going to read out lyrics, reverse from another song. Just as I, we have time just to respond to the Holy Spirit. Are you aching deep inside? Is there shame that makes you hide? Do you wrestle in your mind the reason for your life? Come to Jesus. Come and worship Come before the Lord of life. He will draw you to the Father 
and the grace and peace of God you'll find. Are you financially secure or are you numbered with the poor? Your wealth will never be your cure. Your heart needs something more. Bow down and surrender to him. You are made to worship him.